Welcome to the Holy Post. An unknown country singer with a fake name has skyrocketed to the top of the charts with the song Rich Men North of Richmond. And the film The Sound of Freedom has become one of the top grossing movies of the year. Both of these sleeper hits were fueled by the MAGA media and conservative audiences. What do they say about the movement and the divisions in American culture? Then I talk with Caitlin about the launch of her new book, The Ballot and the Bible, and the way that political movements have used and abused scripture throughout history. She also explains how George W. Bush and Barack Obama used the Bible very differently during their presidencies, and the surprising reason that Obama cited scripture way more often. Also this week, backyard billionaire wrestling, China hires full-time adult children, and a three-year-old with the worst superpower ever. Every week, I encourage you to sign up for Holy Post Plus to access all of our bonus content. But we've gotten a few questions from some of you asking, what exactly is Holy Post Plus, and how is it different from Patreon? That's a great question, and the answer is really simple. They're actually the same thing. Patreon is just the platform where you access all of the Holy Post Plus content. So if you were already a Patreon supporter, that's great. Then you're already a Holy Post Plus subscriber. And if you want to become a new subscriber to Holy Post Plus, don't be confused when you see Patreon on the website. You are in the right place. And this is a good week to do it because we have some outstanding new content. There's a new, more personal episode of Christian Asks where we discuss how we can really know if we're actually maturing in our faith and not just faking it. It gets kind of raw and practical. Plus, we have a bonus interview with Caitlin about her new book, where she and I debate, once again, Jeremiah 29, that popular verse where God commands his people to seek the welfare of the city where they are in exile. I think Christians have abused that verse, misapplied it, and should stop using it so much. But Caitlin thinks we shouldn't abandon it so quickly. It's a lively debate, and you don't want to miss it. So sign up for Holy Post Plus today for those new episodes and boatloads of past content, live streams, the Holy Post Book Club, merchandise, and we've got some incredible new projects in the works for Holy Post Plus that's going to blow your mind. So check it all out at holypost.com. Here is episode 579. Hey there, welcome back to the Holy Post Podcast. This is Phil Vischer. I'm here with Sky Jatani. Hi, Sky. Hi, Phil. Hi, with his Michigan hat on. Go Michigan! M M M M M M M M M M M M. Michigan's yellow. I know. Miami's red. Miami of Ohio. What's Miami of my of Florida? What colors are they? They're orange and green. Oh, oh, that's right. Is that right? Yeah, that's yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. The hurricanes. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Right, Caitlin. Right, Caitlin. No idea. Right, and Caitlin Shess is here, who hasn't met a sports mascot that she could identify. <laughs> Caitlin, what colors? What What are Duke's colors? Please. What are Duke's know that. colors? Blue. And is there another no one? No school has I one color. <laughs> yeah, blue and white. Caitlin. Blue and white. Blue and white. All I know. Okay, I white. know the important thing, which is which blue. I can differentiate the Duke blue and the Carolina blue, and that's important. It's blue devil blue, mm -hmm. right? It's the official blue of a devil. That's, yeah. Actually, fun I fact, think. the earliest mascot or one of the early mascots of Duke was just the yeah. Methodists. So, like, early sports team was just like, we're the Methodists. Yeah. How do you go from the Methodists to <laughs> the devil? That's a good question. I don't know. I don't know that. Yeah, well, clearly, you don't turn the right I way. I know. That's not good. <laughs> Clearly. Okay, now it's time for the theme song. <laughs> What's the news that you like the most? Who's your favorite podcast host? If it's breakfast, get your toast. It's Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. And sometimes Caitlin... This episode of The Holy Post is sponsored by Faithful Counseling. In my 50 years on this earth, life has thrown me more than a few curveballs. The loss of a dream, rough spots in relationships, challenges in parenting, even though friends and family and strangers on Facebook are always ready with advice, my wife Lisa and I have found it tremendously helpful to sit down with a professional therapist. And you can too. Faithful Counseling can help you find a therapist that works for you. With more than 3,000 licensed therapists across all 50 states, it's easy and free to change counselors until you find the right fit. 
fit. Plus, it's more affordable than traditional in-office counseling and financial aid is available. Whether you're struggling with family conflicts, trauma, anxiety, stress, or depression, Faithful Counseling can match you with a Christian therapist who can help. Continue growing into the best version of yourself. Visit faithfulcounseling.com slash holy post and get the professional faith-based counseling you need. They've even got a special offer for our listeners. Right now, you can get 10% off your first month at faithfulcounseling.com slash holy post. And thanks again to Faithful Counseling for sponsoring this episode. This episode of The Holy Post is sponsored by Haya Health. Hey, do you have kids? Do you care about their health? Of course you do. Most kids' vitamins are basically candy in disguise, filled with two teaspoons of sugar, unhealthy chemicals, and other gummy junk kids really shouldn't be eating. That's why Haya was created, the pediatrician-approved, super-powered, chewable vitamin for kids. Zero sugar, zero gummy junk, yet they taste great and are perfect for picky eaters. Haya fills in the most common gaps in modern children's diet to provide the full body nourishment our kids need with a yummy taste they love. And we've worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. Receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, you need to go to HayaHealth.com slash Holy Post. This deal is not available on their regular website. Go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H dot com slash Holy Post and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into health. The adults. And thanks to Haya Health for sponsoring this episode. So next week, if you are a historian at Duke University and can tell us the history <laughs> of going from the the hugging Methodists to the fighting Blue Devils, let us know. Let us know how that happened. Mm -hmm. We got we don't do this very often, but there were a couple of things that came in that I thought were kind of fun. So I got a couple of listener emails. I got a couple listener emails that I'm going to read. First one from a listener came in last week. A few weeks ago, you probably remember this story, Caitlin. A few weeks ago, you had a story about hammerhead flatworms on the East Coast. (laughs) I just want you to know that my five-year-old found one in Kane County, Illinois. That's right next to us. We're in DuPage County. That touches Kane County. That means hammerhead flatworms, which are toxic... And, and almost indestructible, because if you cut them up, you just make more hammerhead flatworms, like killing a hydra. Um, they found one in Kane County, Illinois. That's right. That's right next to us. Also, and, but this is the exciting part. So his five-year-old found a hammerhead flatworm, invasive, toxic, in Kane County, Illinois. Also, his three-year-old brother peed on it to kill it. <laughs> and evidently, there was enough salt to do the trick, because you can't cut them up to kill them. You got to put salt on them. So a quick thinking three year old (laughs) said, I wonder if there's enough salt in my urine to kill this invasive species. I don't think that's what he thought. That is exactly what he thought. But a very, very bright child. Very (laughs) bright child. (laughs) What else has this three year old tried to kill with this pee? That's a good question. That's a good question. Yeah, especially Mm -hmm. after, you know, the local news media praised you. Yeah, this is not good. Once you've become a a minor celebrity (laughs) for killing a dangerous worm with your pee. Oh, boy. I'm going to shame the world over and over ever. Oh, my (laughs) God. Pee boy. (laughs) Stop. Stop right there, invasive worm. I am pee boy. Your arch nemesis. Okay, we got another one that came in that I thought was kind of nice. Uh, someone wrote in and said, YouTube apparently knows me. I'm fine with it because I would not have stumbled on your channel. I find your conversations refreshing and enlightening. It is current and humorous without being outrageous. It is just <laughs> different from all the media that I know. Did Please you, keep it Did up. you write that, Phil? <laughs> no. Not at all outrageous. Caitlin, <laughs> it is it is current and humorous without oh. being outrageous. We're not outrageous. We're current and humorous. Uh-huh. And but this is, I think, the key. It is just different from all the media <laughs> that I know. There's that's nothing, a nice way to put it. Nothing. It's interesting. Quite like. <laughs> no, that's not what I'm saying. He's so he she uh, is so excited to know about us because of a YouTube algorithm. Apparently, thanks. Um, uh, who's in charge of YouTube? Mark Zuckerberg owns YouTube. So thanks, Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, no, he doesn't. Google owns YouTube. Google owns YouTube. Thanks, uh, Sergey Brin and whoever's running Google these days. So I'm kind of curious to know what else he, he follows on yeah. YouTube that led the algorithm to give 
to yeah. feed our and if video and if team. they're okay, let's put this together. If he has never seen anything like the Holy Post, there's nothing like it. That means that none of the stuff he was watching is like it, and yet the algorithm deduced from the stuff he was watching that is not like the Holy Post that he would like Holy Post. That's a very advanced mm. algorithm. I read his mind. It, it knew about him things that he didn't, or she didn't even know about him or her. That's correct. Scary. Is there anything you'd like to add to that, Caitlin? Because it just seems like you really want to. I, I mean, one point no. then for the algorithm. One good thing. Okay. Good job. One point I, for the algorithm. I think we need to use that quote, that endorsement in like our marketing. Like nothing else you've yes. ever seen before or whatever oh, no. he said. It is like just that. different. From <laughs> it's all just <laughs> different. <laughs> Which is, it's a, it sounds like something a third grade teacher would say when she sees your Right, artwork. right. Different. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> just that's different, different, Billy. Or, yeah. or a very diplomatic uh, third grade teacher at, at parent-teacher conference. Your <laughs> child is They're just different. different from all the other children that I know. <laughs> but then he said, please keep it up. Please keep it That's up. Good. So it's, di- good. it's good different. It's good. It's good different. Mm-hmm. Okay. Speaking of things Mark Zuckerberg doesn't own um, to Mark Zuckerberg. Mark Zuckerberg, I don't know if you knew this, but Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk were going to wrestle. Oh, my gosh. They were going to, they challenged each other to a cage match to wrestle. And Mark Zuckerberg has just canceled it. Wait, he wait, wait. This is real? Yes. Yeah, I thought this was a. Jo- I thought people were joking no. that they were saying this to no. each other. No, they were actually no. because they both like take jujitsu. Because you know, here's the deal: if you grew up nerdy enough to do what they do, you got picked on in grade school, and so uh, Jeff Bezos Phil, the same way. Phil, they were I'll, just different. They were just, <laughs> just different. <laughs> yeah, if you grew up different enough to do what they do. You got picked on a lot in grade school, and depending on when you grew up, it, you might have gotten picked up in high, picked on in high school too, because you know it didn't become cool to be a nerd until I don't know when, not not that long ago. You could be a nerd in high school and be cool because they figure, hey, he's probably going to rule the world someday, and I want to be on his good side so I can get free software. So you, at some point, as you're growing up, you want to be perceived as more manly. Jeff Bezos just started working out like a maniac, you know. So if like Jeff Bezos has has guns now and he dresses like he's in top gun he, it's odd because he got picked on he doesn't like it he wants to be cool so elon musk and mark zuckerberg both start taking martial arts we're cool we're tough we're not going to get picked on anymore and then people point out that they're both taking martial arts and insulting each other because of the whole twitter threads you know well now i'm x and that's cooler than threads is x so they challenge each other to a, a cage match, and uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg backed down. In a post on his Threads site, see, I will only say things on s- s- networks that I created. My only form of communication will be on <laughs> things that I made. So everything I say from here on out will be on an old VeggieTales VHS cassette. <laughs> In a post on his thread site, Zuckerberg wrote, I think we can all agree Elon isn't serious and it's time to move on. I offered a real date. Dana White offered to make this a legit competition for charity. Elon won't confirm a date, then says he needs surgery and now asks to do a practice round in my backyard instead. He added, "If El- yeah, this is all true, Caitlin. And this is what the most powerful men in the universe are spending their time talking about. He added, if Elon ever gets serious about a real date and official event, he knows how to reach me. Otherwise, time to move on. I'm going to focus on competing with people who take the sport seriously. So that's now Mark Zuckerberg's focus is who he should wrestle. Dear Lord. I I feel like the caliber of our billionaires isn't what it used to be. Like yeah, remember you, you when don't insecure- see Carnegie and and Rockefeller yeah. doing that? I like remember when insecure male ego meant faster cars, bigger plane, yeah. buy a new company, and now it's just let's wrestle in my backyard. Well, I'm sorry. Well, let's go back even further, and it meant let's pick up pistols yeah. and yeah. shoot at each other. Yeah, so yeah. okay, so you're saying so which is better? Which is worse? Okay, which is worse? Dueling because of your male ego or a cage match jujitsu wrestling. Yeah, but they're not even doing it. They're just, it's all bluster. Talking about a cage match where you're going to 
maybe or not jujitsu. I'm sure wrestling. there was a lot of talking about dueling that did not result in dueling. That's true. Yeah, that's probably true. Caitlin, in your experience, do, say, female theologians ever <laughs> challenge each other to <laughs> feats of physical aggression? No. Strangely enough, no? that has yet huh. to occur in well, my what, Okay, let's go through church history. Any famous church mothers ever? Because there was some kind well, of weird stuff. There, there were some weird stuff There have been plenty down. of women in church history who were martyred. Yeah, okay. They were not very what likely about, to instigate the... Okay, Conflict. Joan of Arc. What about Joan of Arc? Yeah, is she jo not Joan really? Is, is she mm -hmm. a church mother? She's not really a church mother. I mean, sure, broadly conceived. She's yeah. a martyr. She's a broadly church mother. Okay, and she she's a martyr or a mo she was martyred. Yeah, yeah but yeah. first yeah. She, she she went she you know went to town on some guys' butts. Mm -hmm. She was a tough. Cookie. You found one. Okay. <laughs> hey. No, let's not pretend like women don't have their own forms of conflict. Oh, they do. It's just not likely yeah. to, to be you know, like I'm this. I'm talking about combat. Yeah, combat. no. Well, Social combat, does that count? Uh, it's right, a little I'm different. Move on. It feels like you want me to move on. That's, <laughs> what it, that's what it feels like, Caitlin. It feels like I can... I spend so much time, Phil, dealing with male egos. I don't want to talk about them anymore. <laughs> okay, how about this? This is interesting. Facing job scarcity in China. This is from our China desk. You may not know that the Holy Post has a full-time <laughs> China staff. They're in Beijing. They're, they send in stuff every week and we usually say, nah, nah, not that interesting because Elon Musk is going to mm -hmm. wrestle Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> uh, facing job scarcity in China, some find work as full-time children. Okay, this is a new trend. Sounds like our job. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like the guys that run our social media <laughs> networks. Uh, oh in, in recent months, the hashtags full-time daughter and full-time son have been trending on Chinese social media platforms, attracting millions of views. They refer to adult children who, due to unemployment, are hired by their parents to do ho housework and to be on hand whenever needed. Okay, youth unemployment has become a serious challenge in China. The jobless rate among people aged 16 to 24 was a record 21% in June. So some kids, young adults, are kind of giving up on the whole employment thing and their parents are helping out by hiring them to just be around. Hold on a second. Yeah. Like What's up, in, Sky? in the United States, we might say this is failure to launch. It might be, uh -huh. you know, moving back into your parents' basement after school kind of stuff. But no one uh -huh. sees that as a job. Uh -huh. It's it's that's because no one. That's because we don't pay them. We don't pay. Right. Them that's my point. It. So are they? It's just like a. Is this a face saving thing to say I'm employed by my parents when in fact you're just mooching well, off of them let's talk to to lu ji an assistant assistant professor at the lee kuan yu school of public policy at the national university of singapore who told nbc news compared to previous years young people who are now unemployed and stayed and, and staying at home to study for exams have less confidence that they will succeed in their exam preparation and job hunting so psychologically, the term full-time children allows room for denial and self-deprecation, which makes it more socially acceptable. So it is face-saving. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Lou said some Chinese state media organizations are trying to nationalize and glorify the emergence of full-time children as filial piety. It shows their devotion to family and to their parents to become full-time children. Okay. See, Caitlin, you don't have to do I... all this work. You don't have to learn German. <laughs> well, so in other words, instead of saying my kid can't find a job, you just say my kid is very uh, family devoted. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A f a f a f filial piety. F I have a filial a piety. I have a right. filially pious child. I will say hmm. there is a section of this article that I was reading that says that you know, part of it is like a pushback against just how grueling China's work culture had become yeah. in terms of like 72 hour work weeks and no vacation. And it's also interesting that reading this, it's like sort of sounds like a description of like past family arrangements where not only did people stay with their parents, at least very close by, even if they were married or had their own children. And a lot of the work that they did that was considered work was caring for the larger 
family. So that's just yeah. an interesting, like, do you reach a point where you kind of circle back and start having the same kind of social okay, configurations so you point. once had? That's a good, that's a good point, Caitlin Chess. Caitlin Thank you, Chess, Phil. you should be learning German right now, but you're doing this instead. And it's also not promoting your book, so I'll have to promote your book so you can justify <laughs> taking this much of your time. So go back 40 years before the, you know, the Chinese revolution, not the, the Chinese revolution, but the industrial, mm -hmm. what's happened, the economic miracle of, of China. And most of the Chinese population was rural and most of the Chinese population was agrarian. And so if you, you don't grow up, go to university and then go off to the big city yeah. and get a job. You didn't do that. And then, you know, the economic revolution happened and that became the model for all of the kids. You're, you have one kid, all of the one kid that you get to have. You raise your son to go to university and then they'll go off to Beijing and they'll get a great job and they'll take care of you. And that's sort of breaking. You know, there's some question about whether the, the Chinese economic miracle has run its course and is ending because the, um, all sorts of stuff is going on. And the unemployment rate for all these kids that went to university is skyrocketing. So is this a way to go back to more of that prior rural agrarian model, even though you don't live rurally or agrarianly. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what these kids are doing is driving their parents to the grocery store, doing shopping for them. You know, so the assumption is that the, the economic miracle worked for their parents, but it's not working for mm -hmm. them. So we're forming a new sort of familial piety. Okay, I'm no economist. But here's the part I don't understand. But now you can play one on TV. <laughs> Go for right. it. Right. Here's the part I don't understand. From what I've read and actual economists that I've talked to have said, you cannot have a growing economy without a growing population. Yes. Because as the older generation ages out of employment, you need people to replace them in the market to keep generating tax revenue and economic prosperity and all that. The problem with China's one-child policy is the fear at the time from the government was the population was growing too quickly, so they institute this one-child policy. Yep. And so you had a demographic bubble. And now, as those parents are aging older and retiring from employment, you have fewer children to replace the two parents. You only have one child to replace those parents. So I don't understand how both these things are happening at the same time. How can you have a demographic bubble like that Mm -hmm. and such high unemployment when there should be massive employment because there's fewer people sky to fill is, those slots that is such a good question and i am no economist but <laughs> i love a, any sentence that starts with i'm no but <laughs> mm -hmm. but i am going to say something anyway um, that may defy logic or <laughs> knowledge one of the big things that has happened is that the continuing economic rise of China over the last uh, 20 years, not necessarily the 20 years before that, the 20 years before that were primarily building factories and becoming a man, you know, the manufacturer of the world. Mm -hmm. Since then, what has sustained the economy in the last 20 years is real estate speculation and building apartment everywhere building roads building bridges building airports building apartments and that is what is collapsing mm -hmm. you know some of the biggest real estate uh, companies in China are defaulting you know one of them is on the verge one of them did last year the next biggest one and they have you know we're talking like 150 billion dollars in debt that they've just used to build apartment buildings and high rises that are now many of them are empty because it, it's just they they built too much so all the jobs that were uh, creating a real estate economy in china are going away and those are the jobs that a lot of these kids would have gone into was sustaining this bubble the real estate bubble so as the real estate bubble bursts it's trickling through the entire economy. You also have Western companies are feeling very, very vulnerable to China and their supply chains, so they're looking for other sources. So Apple's right. making iPhones in India, and everyone's trying to figure out how to make stuff other places and right. buy their goods other places so they're not so dependent on China. And that is having an effect, and we're seeing it in, in skyrocketing youth unemployment and now professional children. So what about if you're one of these couples that only had pretty one good? Child. That was pretty good, Caitlin. That was, wasn't it? I, yeah, I mean, you're a little bit impressed. Wow, you were uh -huh. like, I'm not an economist, but I have read a lot of things. <laughs> okay, so if you're one of these couples that only had one child, and let's say that child 
uh, graduated from school and actually found meaningful employment. Yeah. Good but on you. But you still want help. Can you hire someone else to be oh, sure. your adult There's child? So many kids. Yeah. I don't know how many people are doing that. Maybe it's like a dishonor to be, you know, uh. to be someone else's filial, filial pie, pie slice. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, it's just like it's, the baby boomer generation here is aging and and has a lot of healthcare needs and and you know all that and and it's yeah. it's a massive growing part of our economy is caring for aging baby boomers. Yeah. The same thing has to be happening in China where the the yep. people who came from that larger generation are aging into retirement. They must have big economic needs and I don't know if they're needs yeah they're things. aging but they're they're way behind Japan in terms right. of mm-hmm. you know where Japan yeah, has yeah. to build healthcare robots to just carry around mm-hmm. all the old people because they don't know they don't have enough kids to do it so they're they're behind Japan um, maybe by 20 years but th- when that happens in China it's on such a larger scale mm-hmm. than it's happening in Japan that's woof boy okay that was supposed to be a lighthearted story but now I'm really concerned about the future of the world <laughs> But you know we what's need, encouraging in this? Need more Wow, well, K- Caitlin, what? I just think, I mean, this is not the same dynamic here as in this article about China, but I okay. do think there are a lot of young people who are really disillusioned with the kind of story that they were sold about what constitutes a successful life and especially yep. this like return to just like caring for people. I mean, even in in America, as Sky was just saying, like a crisis of healthcare providers is partially just that like we no longer have family structures that assume that you will take care of the elderly. And a lot of those dynamics are are going to continue. We have a culture that just in general wants to discard whoever is unusable to us. At the same time, I think a lot, I mean, when I look at my peers, a lot of people are either considering or actually have given up what would be considered successful careers, kind of climbing the corporate ladder or the academic ladder or et cetera, because they've realized it actually is really satisfying to live a pretty quiet life where they're just basically taking care of their basic needs and also able to actually in a physical, intimate way care for their children or their elderly parents or whatever. And I think that's positive. Okay. I think that's positive. I do think that many of us Americans, because we don't have the sense of familial responsibility that you you often grow up with in the East, we're more likely to say, hey, can we hire some Mm -hmm. of those unemployed Chinese kids to come Mm -hmm. over and take care of our parents? Because otherwise I'd have to do that and I really don't want to. And where, you know, in in Chinese culture or many Eastern cultures, that would be considered dishonorable. You know, you're 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 paying a stranger to take care of your mother. We've kind of almost celebrated that. It's like, yeah, I got mm-hmm. I, they're they're fine. I'll see them at Christmas. So I don't know. Maybe that's how we solve the problem: is we hire half of the Chinese kids that can't mm-hmm. find jobs mm-hmm. to do all of our elderly <laughs> health care. I vote no on that one, Caitlin. Caitlin's I'm not, not saying it's a good solution, <laughs> no, but, but I'm saying it might appeal to uh, Americans. But Phil, what you're what you're stumbling into there is another economic reality, which I Uh-oh. have talked to economists about, which is oh. as the birth rates drop, yes, and it hurts economics, like in Japan where the birth rate has completely dropped, the only way you have to get new workers from somewhere, mm-hmm. and if you're yeah. not birthing them, then you then immigration becomes the way that happens. In the United States, natural born Americans are having fewer and fewer children, yeah. but because of immigration, our economy is still growing. Same yeah. thing in Western Europe. The birth rates plummeted, but they've brought in a lot of immigrants from other parts of the world, which is creating all kinds of national Tension. tensions in Europe. But Japan doesn't allow immigration, and mm. China is not an immigration mm-hmm. magnet mm-hmm. either. So those two societies are really struggling because without immigration as a tool, they have to rely entirely on their own national birth rates, which it's just not right. working. Or you do what Russia tried to do and, and just pay people to have babies. Like, we'll well, give Japan's you a thousand- tried that yeah, too, yeah. and it didn't work. Oh, man, you can't even pay people to have babies. Mm-hmm. We really don't like babies. Caitlin, That's do you true. like babies? I love babies. <laughs> man, what's the secret? What's the secret to liking babies? Because people, you know, Sanctification. We're, pushing, we're pushing baby strollers with pugs in them rather than yeah, have babies. That's just really awful. And, and midget pigs, for heaven's Mm-mm. sake. What? Okay. Uh, what's the name of a small pig? What are they called, the small pigs? Piglets. Midget. No. <laughs> no, those grow to be huge pigs. 
<laughs> uh, dwarf pigs. Um, I didn't know that was a thing. Yeah, it is a thing. You, yeah, they, they don't get big. They're just, and people have them for pets. Tiny pigs. Pygmies. Pygmies. That's oh. funny. What's it called? It's not called pygmies. But that was a good try, Sky. Thanks. You get an A for effort. Caitlin's looking it up, and she's not. Are they just little pigs? Having any little pigs? I just keep seeing mini it's pigs. It's a little village. Miniature mini pigs, pigs, also called Miniature pygmy pigs. pigs. Ah, I was oh. right. I was pig right. Pig. That's, also that's called redundant. the Vietnamese pot-bellied pig. Oh, yes. Vietnamese pot-bellied pigs. That's what they were. And then there and, is and something were... in German after that that I can't read. Oh, oh that, well, that's not good. That's because you're spending too much time with us and not enough time learning your German. Okay, I got to move on. Um, popular media. We've had a couple of things happen this summer that have become, one is a song, one is a movie that have become, I would say, Rorschach tests for your, amazingly, for your politics, <laughs> of all things. Either you think these movies are the best thing ever, or you think these movies are a sign that the country is just completely off the rails and people are going crazy. Okay, the song is Rich Men North of Richmond by Oliver Anthony. A very good spoiler, title. Spoiler, not his real name. That's his it's stage. Not? Oh. No, it's his stage name. Oliver Anthony is not it's his a real night, name. It's a good name. What's his real so name? That makes sense. I, uh, Google it. Caitlin, Google it. And it's not Pot Belly Pig either. <laughs> I almost guarantee it. So he wrote the song Rich Men North of Richmond. It somehow got uploaded to uh, Twitter. And, and what's his real name? Chris Caitlin? Lunsford. Chris Lunsford. See, Oliver Anthony just sounds so much more blue collar. No, it, does. it, it doesn't. It sounds British. British. Yeah. <laughs> So Oliver Anthony, not really his, his name, uh, wrote a song called Rich Men North of Richmond, which is about, it's in the spirit of Woody Guthrie. It's in the spirit of the old, you know, blue collar troubadours that stood up for the common man, that stood up for the working class. And that is people on the right have gone nutsy for this song and it and drove it because of a couple of tweets and social media endorsements to the number one song spot on itunes where i think it's been for three weeks now the number one song on itunes is a guy you've never heard of it's not even his real name you've never heard of singing about the plight of the working class um christian today wrote a piece hannah anderson critiquing the song which was interesting and this is where it gets really interesting and uh, saying that it wasn't truly in favor of lower income people and uh, the right wing people that have been promoting it are now so i saw someone on twitter calling for ct to be shut down we have to shut down christianity today yeah. because they're so out of touch with the plight of the working man so what's the controversy i'll tell you sky i'll tell mm -hmm. you sky what the controversy is because you're wondering there's some odd discontinuities in the song for example mr not anthony uh, laments people who don't have enough food, but also rails against food aid. He laments low wages, but does not support unions or collective bargaining, which was the kind of the hallmark of prior blue collar songwriters. So blue collar songwriters of the 20s, 30s and 40s were almost always uh, promoting unions, were pro-union, and you would probably today would call them socialists. Uh, Oliver Anthony, not his real name, is a new form of blue-collar troubadour in that he's a, a modern um, right-wing blue-collar troubadour in that he hates, it's primarily about disliking the government and saying that progressives want to control everything, not actually about helping the working man or helping the poor. All right, can I just ask a question here? Yes. Because this is a, I, like, Country songs, I'm not a country song expert, just mm -hmm. like I'm not an economist. But my understanding is country music has a long, long history of like lament, right? And it, sometimes yes. it's personal lament, like, it's, you know, she, she left me and took my dog and my pickup, and now yeah, I'm destined. Yeah, you know? I think it's more often that. Right. But it, how, like, can you really deduce someone's political philosophy from a song? When and what? do we know that's an accurate reflection of what he actually believes? Okay, okay. Or is it just Sky. a kind of well composed, you know, song that expresses something that isn't meant to be a coherent political philosophy? I don't know. Well, it's not a coherent political philosophy. 
Right. Whether whether it's meant to be or not. Yeah, but that's my point. People are taking it so seriously. And well, he, I don't know if it's meant to be. He attacks people on welfare, but laments that there are people walking around hungry. Right. Uh, we'll get into that incoherent. In a minute, right. But that's my point. Is he trying to even be co- like, why are people taking this as an anthem to rally around when it's just a random assortment of complaints? Be- because he um, he picks up the mantle of grievance that many on the right have towards that the, the, the problem with our country is that progressives have ruined it. Uh, in the 30s, the problem in our country was the industrialists are ruining it, and the working man needs to join together and rise up against the industrialists through collective bargaining and labor unions, et cetera, et cetera, and more socialized medicine, more socialized. But now, we, we, now the right is in a very interesting circumstance in that they think the working man is getting the short end of the stick, but they also think all the things that prior blue collar activists fought for are communist and Marxist. And so we have to reject those too. So we have to reject the problem and the solution. Okay. Before Caitlin, I want to get your smart take on this. But before that, my dumb take on this is I think the appeal of the song is not that it's rallying against the rich men north of Richmond. It's really it's it's a zero sum argument saying that the government is helping. I mean, the the code language here or the dog whistle is the government is helping black urban people who are poor at the expense of white rural people who are poor. And so the, the attitude is if people of color or immigrants have opportunities or gain jobs and wealth, it must be coming at the expense of poor white citizens. That's the argument of this song. It's not, they're not saying rich people are getting richer at the expense of the poor. They're saying poor white people are staying poor while poor black people are getting handouts. And where in the song did he say that? Because it talks about, hold on, let me pull up my lyrics somewhere It talks about welfare recipients. Yeah, but that's always been code language since the 1980s for people of color. Do you you think he's coding that? Yeah. Okay. Because it's kind of, it's an urban, Hmm. he's comparing people who take welfare. I'm using air quotes because that's usually urban people of color from poor white people who need more help. And mm-hmm. so it felt like a song that's juxtaposing one group against another. It's not rich, powerful against poor and destitute. It's one set of needy people against another set yeah. of needy people. Yeah. Um, you could definitely make that argument. And Caitlin is about to make either that argument or an even better one. Oh, wow. Um, No, I think Sky is right. I think the difficult thing with this song is that on one hand, it did get slotted immediately into kind of a a binary political framework in which if you were more progressive, you had to be against the song. And if you were more conservative, this had to be the song for you. And it seems like it's a perfect example of the thing where we have to both say someone is expressing a legitimate concern and like a cry from a place of being harmed And we want to take that part seriously. And then on the other hand, they have been formed and shaped in such a way as to misdirect that cry towards and against those who it shouldn't be directed against. I mean, most of the song, like Sky said, most of the song seems fine. Like there is an identification that powerful people do not have the incentive to help the poor. And that's absolutely true. And then it's Mm -hmm. the second half of the song that sort of switches towards really the politicians care about those on welfare and I'm paying for your fudge rounds or, you know, whatever. And Mm -hmm. it's a it's a misunderstanding of like what the real problem is. But it's describing a real concern. And Hannah talks about in the art in the CT article, Hannah Anderson talks about how much all of this plays on certain stereotypes about welfare recipients and the real shame that she and her family felt when they were in a position where her husband was a pastor, they had a lot of kids, they were not coded, as Sky was talking about, in the ways people would assume to be on welfare. And they were, but there was all of this shame around it. And so it seems like the perfect example of like, you are really probably experiencing real suffering. You're you're mourning the loss of traditional means of revenue in your community. You're seeing how people are suffering. You're seeing how the plight of those in your community is ignored by powerful people in other places who control a lot of your life from your perspective. But you're misdirecting it towards, and that's, 
I mean, honestly, this particular conflict between poor white people and black people in America has been stoked by more powerful people throughout all of American history to really mm. hurt, hurt both of those groups of people. And the difficult mm -hmm. thing with a song like this is you have to both say you are so misunderstanding what the real problem is at the same time not invalidating that it's coming from a place of being harmed and that like that that's a concern that needs to be taken seriously okay the the, the stanza and i agree 100 percent with what caitlin just said the stanza that i think really captures this i just pull up the lyrics says i wish politicians would look out for minors minors we generally associate as rural white yeah. people mm -hmm. and not just minors on an island somewhere minors m-i-n-o-r-s meaning kids right? foreign workers or uh -huh. immigrants no jeffrey and then epstein. it says lord that we got means jeffrey epstein and the minors that yeah. they wanted yeah, to have yeah, sex yeah. with on is his that yeah, what i really about? think there's a yes. q anani thing going on here yes yeah oh, it's a jeffrey okay. epstein reference got it lord we got folks in the street ain't got nothing to eat and these obese milk and welfare and the obese milking welfare he says well mm -hmm. god if you're five foot three and you're 300 pounds taxes ought not be paying your bags of fudge rounds like there's this whole anti welfare yeah. thing and it's like well We've talked about this many times. There are far more white people on welfare than people of color. Mm -hmm. But the assumption is welfare is something yes. that only urban people of color utilize. And abuse. Abuse. And yeah, abuse. and the assumption if is I, that people if, abuse it, yeah. Right, and that's what he's family, assuming here, because if you're overweight, you shouldn't be on, you right. shouldn't get food. Yeah, yeah. And I do wonder how many 300-pound, 5-foot-3 people in his community are walking around eating Little Debbie fudge rounds that they bought with food stamps or is well, this a, a, something that he came up with in his own head? and there's a whole other dynamic too when it comes to health and weight here of like people who don't have access to the most nutritious food tend to be to tend to weigh more than people who do have access to it so the idea that someone right, would be overweight right. and on food stamps actually makes a lot of sense and yes. is a symptom of poverty not wow. you're obviously abusing it it really right. sounds like what you guys are saying, Caitlin and Sky, is that this is complex and this song oversimplifies it, but so does the media on both sides. Is that maybe what you're saying? Yeah, and can I add a point that comes from Jonah Goldberg who wrote an interesting piece on this? Oh. He he was also talking about how ridiculous it is that everybody is overanalyzing this song and trying to build some kind of argument from it. Yes, he said and while he, overanalyzing the song. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And he, and he gives the example of Edwin Starr's song, War, What Is It Good For?, which was kind of an anthem back during Absolutely Vietnam. Absolutely nothing. Right. Say it huh. again. And he says, you know, that, that song captured the spirit of a, a particular group at a particular time with a particular sentiment. It wasn't trying to communicate a universal truth. And he said, if you played that song for people who survived the Holocaust yeah, in Europe yeah. or mm -hmm. or enslaved African-Americans during or before the Civil War or Ukrainians today who are at war for their like they would you would they wouldn't ever yeah. sing war. What yeah. is it good for? Because they're all fighting for their lives and freedom. But for the Vietnam generation and that whole like in that context, it made sense. And same thing here where this song for some Americans does capture their angst and grievance and feeling of abandonment and that's legitimate mm -hmm. but once you expand it and say oh this is a critique of the whole you know maga blah 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 it's like you're you're over you're reading way more into this song than it was probably ever intended to do and everyone needs to just chill out a little bit uh, do you think are you saying caitlin's reading too much into the song are you reading too much into the song sky when you no, say I there's a dog whistle in there I think the people who are exalting this song as emblematic of an entire huge political movement in America mm -hmm. yeah. and that it captures all of what's wrong with the American political system are overreading it. And when okay. we break it down the way we have, we're seeing that this is more emotional than it is logical. And it's okay. not it, it, like the war. What is a good for song? It's it's expressing a particular sentiment of a group of people about what they're facing in the world. And to read more than that and to say, let's build a whole cohesive argument politically and socially on this is okay. probably stretching it way too far. So then uh, what about the movie Sound of Freedom? Next Rorschach mm -hmm. test. 
Okay, some people, Sound of Freedom, surprise hit of the summer, low budget movie made by, a, I think a Mexican director was was on, a Fox paid for it, but then Fox was bought by Disney. Disney said, we don't like this movie, it's kind of weird, uh, we're just gonna let it go. And so Angel Studios picked it up, the Chosen guys, not the guys who make Chosen, but the guys who distribute Chosen and raise money for Chosen. They raised a million and a half for P&A, and, which is a teeny, teeny, but they use their huge network, their huge network of Chosen viewers and all the people that support all of their projects. And it uh, is in the top 10 movies of the year at domestic box office. It's about to pass $180 million. It uh, has passed both the new Indiana Jones movie and Tom Cruise's latest Mission Impossible movie. Um, it's the surprise hit of the summer. It is about... Uh, you know, probably know the story. It's a, based roughly on a true story of a guy who uh, uh, combats child sex trafficking. And it became like the song by uh, Not Oliver Anthony, became representative of a huge right wing feeling that you, this is what's been happening. This is the most important movie of the year because it exposes how much. Um, uh, child sex trafficking is going on in North America and this is why we have to build the wall and this is why we have to close the border and this is why we you know so it's and, and then on the left people are saying wow this is like a QAnon movie this is like all their wacko like be, partly because the star Jim Caviezel was quoted on a podcast saying he supported theories about uh, uh, child trafficking so that that elites can uh, drain something out of their blood to stay uh, young longer so it gets a little weird it gets a little weird there's nothing in the movie yeah. about that that's not in the movie it just seems to be in the star of the movie um, but it's become a Rorschach test for you know is this an embarrassing QAnon movie or is this the most important movie of the year that exposes this huge problem of child sex trafficking Scott. wasn't there some controversy around the the guy it's actually about he's yeah. a little bit controversial mm -hmm. Yeah. What I don't. He what, probably the, exaggerated that? his accounts of, you know. Yeah. Dramatically rescuing children. Yeah. Which is yeah, rife if, in the anti-trafficking world. Is like, it's more complicated than we want the story to be. So we often want to tell kind of dramatic, rescue stories. Yeah, but it's a movie. Are Movies aren't real. supposed to, to teach you what really happened. Just to sh show you how it's been politicized, Donald Trump had his own private mm -hmm. screening of the movie so he could say how important it was. Yeah, everything is politicized now. Well, you know what I think is is active in both of these, in both the song and the movie, is yes, this desire yes. that we have to have evil be easily recognizable. And so it's just, I know, in the song's case, like, I know who to blame for this. It's clear to me. I walk mm -hmm. around the streets. I see you. You look like you're abusing welfare. You must be the bad guy. It, I... I will be able I, I will be easily able to discern what is wrong here in the movie it plays on people's beliefs and we've had really a complicated history with this especially among evangelicals where we've had a lot of energy around anti-trafficking things but we've often deeply misunderstood the actual dynamics that go into play with trafficking a few years ago i went to the philippines with a group my refuge house that does aftercare for girls who have been um, abused by their families and and trafficked in, in on in an online format and it was most of the trip was spent just telling us how we were wrong about how we thought trafficking worked. And most of the information we'd gotten online was incorrect. And a lot of the, you know, international organizations involved in the Philippines have had to do all this work to learn from locals. But what's happening here? It's not the same, actually, as somewhere else. And so in that case of the movie, it plays on people's desires that, of course, it's going to be the person who looks like a trafficker that I see in the Target parking lot. That must be how this works. They steal a kid and, they, and it doesn't work that way. It's all more complicated than that. There's all these financial dynamics with parents who, you know, are like, do I give my kid up and leave them on the street or am I forced financially into a situation where I have to exploit them? And that's awful, but it's a so much more complicated scenario. We want it to be easy to identify where evil is. And media right. like this comforts us sometimes that we can do that. That, of course, your snap judgments of what is evil and what is good are correct. And then we have that same dynamic going on with how people have perceived both of these movies. If I can know what camp it's from, I can know if it's good or bad. It's just easy for me mm -hmm. to discern. And the more complicated truth is that actually the fallenness of our hearts make it really hard for us to discern what is actually at the root of this problem? What kind of corruption or injustice is actually at play here? And to not have our own motivations of what we want, who we want the good guys to be and who we want the bad guys to be to play into that is really, really difficult. Yeah, it's it's that we want we want to believe the whole world 
everyone in the world is either wearing a black hat or yep. a white hat. And clearly I'm wearing a white hat. Right. And th- these You're kinds of a media products. And, <laughs> right. and, and these kinds of media products reinforce that black yeah. hat, white hat, you're wearing a white hat, and it's pretty obvious and easy to identify who's got the black hat, and it makes us all feel more self-righteous. Yeah, it feels really yeah. good. Well, yeah. do you remember the Rocky movies? Are you old enough to mm-hmm. remember the Rocky movies, Sky? I'm not of even going to ask Caitlin. I mean, I know what they are. Yeah, it's like a it's fighting like, thing. Who's, who's the, when, they, when they got to... When, <laughs> It's a fighting thing, yeah. like America. Um, <laughs> when they got when they got distilled down to the point where it was just Rocky versus Russia. Mm-hmm. It's just that simple. Wait, Crazy. really? It's, what, it's a bu- yes. Yeah, 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 it was, yeah. Rocky it was four. The Russian hero, the Russian uh-huh. hero versus, and so Rocky was America and good and mom and freedom, and the Russian hero was evil oh, and the the. Soviet. And he's literally wearing red and white. St- and yeah, star he's got, stripe you know, like, shorts. Yeah. Oh gosh! And and the Russians yeah. got red shorts. Like it's just that's so. What that's yeah. what works in a movie theater. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nuance mm-hmm. is not very exciting in a movie theater. And this is okay. So this is bothering me. And then we need to wrap it up. Um, it feels like our media is just being divided, like everything else, into red state media and blue state media. And it's yeah. you know it's the New York Times or it's the Daily Wire, it's uh, the Barbie movie or it's the Sound of Freedom. You know, and you have to take your pick. And and I feel really caught in the middle as a filmmaker because I don't know who my <laughs> audience is. I because I or like who am I getting money from to make a movie? Because if I go to the blue state guys, they might not like what I say because I want to talk about the Bible. If I go to the red state guys, they might not like what I say because I don't want to do all the stuff that Ben Shapiro and Matt Walsh want me to do about gender and all that stuff. So. I I guess it's what everyone else, you know, who's trying to like, trying to stay out of the binary, trying to stay out of, you know, both of the gutters on both sides of the bowling lane that are so easy to just, hey, it's much smoother over here in the gutters. This is hard. It's hard to say, you know, I'm not just going to demonize the song and these Mm -hmm. movies, but I'm also not going to hold them up and and lionize them either. They're neither demons nor lions. And I, I mean, I don't think Anthony Oliver, Oliver Anthony, not his name, <laughs> wrote that song thinking he was going to make millions and millions of dollars off of it. No, and maybe not. that's not true of the Sound of Freedom movie makers either. But now that there's so clearly a market for stuff that reinforces what the far right wants to hear. And there's obviously a big market for people on the far left and what they want to hear. Yep. Like it just creates more and more and more of that media because that's where the money yep. is. And it's right. so much harder to have that nuanced, thoughtful engagement because there's just not as big a market for it. Yeah, yeah, except for the Barbie movie. And that was a cartoon, you know, this is a cartoon presentation of a cartoonish, I'm not saying literal cartoon, Caitlin. I was like, Phil, you need to watch the Barbie movie. (laughs) Don't do your eyebrows at me like that. Twice, I saw it twice, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm a devotee. (laughs) I see, there's, you know, I, I, growing up, I was a little bit Alan, I'm afraid. I was, you know, standing on the outside, looking at the guys. And that's why you and I are going to do a cage match. They're going to totally hurt themselves. To prove who's more masculine. Alans of the world unite. Um, (laughs) I, yeah. So the, the number one movie so far this year is Super Mario Brothers, which people on the right have said, that's because it's not woke. So what that proves is you go woke, you go broke, Hollywood. Yes, Super Mario Brothers is currently the number one movie of the year. It is about to be passed by the Barbie movie, which is about to become the number one movie of the year. Kind of messing with the go woke, go broke (laughs) uh, paradigm. So everyone is confused. Everyone is confused. Why? About, why are these red red state movies doing so well? Well, the, why, why is Barbie doing so well? I don't know. Why can't it just be make really good mm-hmm. stories promoting what worldview sky, demonizing which side? I I mean I saw Barbie and we don't have to get into this whole Barbie thing, but like, <laughs> I think part of the reason it was successful is because it was a very entertaining movie. Yes, I don't think was. people are going multiple times because they want to have their worldview reinforced. But they I think cry. they're going multiple times because they were cry entertained. In it. They cry in it, Sky. They cry in it. That's multiple true. generations together crying in the Fine. theater. Fine, but I don't think it's because they're they're not crying over having their worldview reinforced. They're they're crying because they feel seen. 
Okay. Like that is my experience. Mm -hmm. But also I think people like, I mean, people don't, people cannot psychologically handle too much confrontation to their worldview, right. but they can right. handle some posing of interesting questions. And I do think it's really telling that the Barbie movie does not kind of lay out a philosophy of gender in the world, but does kind of mm -hmm. provoke you to think about it. And I've been encouraged by the fact that people who I know who so disagree with me about gender have had lively conversations with me and with other people about yeah. it. And that's great. Okay, we got to wrap it up. We've gone too long. But <laughs> something amazing is happening in just a few days. It's the real, like tomorrow, the next day? Yesterday. Next day, tomorrow, well, as we record this? Tomorrow from today, yesterday from now. Yesterday from when this comes out. <laughs> so as you're listening to this, wow, say that again, Caitlin. Tomorrow from today, but yesterday from now. Yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> hey, Sounds like you, a really bad movie title. <laughs> you've been sampling the mushrooms in your backyard. <laughs> Caitlin's book is coming out. Sky is about to sit down with her and talk all about it. And you're going to get a sneak peek because you probably don't have it yet because it doesn't come out until tomorrow, yesterday, today, <laughs> forever, like Jesus. And uh, you're going to learn all about it. He is tomorrow, yesterday, and today, and f forever. <laughs> yep. Thanks for listening. Hang out for the interview. Sky, don't look at me that way. I'm, not, I'm not looking at you. Let's not compare you to my book to match. Jesus again. That would be I am You're the one who said it was yesterday, <laughs> today, and forever. It's not what I said. It's eternal. <laughs> it's timeless. Okay. I'm going to fight Sky. I'm going to fight Sky <laughs> in a cage match. And we're going to see Aww. who's the most Allen. Who's the, and then who's the second most Allen. There is no Ken in the match, I don't think. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Last word, Sky. Last word. I'll take you down, Phil. Ah, this is when I'm out. That's <laughs> take you down to Chinatown. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks, Caitlin. Um, good luck with the book launch, and here comes the interview. Do not go away, even if I do a couple of ads now that you don't want to hear. <laughs> Listen to them anyway, so you can get to Caitlin. Okay, bye. This episode is sponsored by the Center for Pastor Theologians. How can we respond to a world today, both outside and inside the church, that is awash in anti-intellectualism and tribalism? The Center for Pastor Theologians gathers pastors and ministry leaders from across the spectrum of evangelical belief for nuanced and challenging conversation about the issues facing the church in today's world. If this sounds like a community you'd like to be a part of, we invite you to join us in Chicago for our annual Theology Conference. Conference, Power and the Pulpit, Recovering a Theology of Preaching. Holy Post listeners will recognize several of this year's conference speakers, including Charlie Dates, Caitlin Beatty, Matthew Kim, and Mike Cosper. You can go to cptconference.com and register to join us in Chicago on October 23rd to 25th for this unique theology conference for pastors and ministry leaders. Holy Post listeners get $10 off their registration fee with the code HOLYPOST. Again, visit cptconference.com and use code HOLYPOST to get $10 off and secure your spot today. And thank you to the Center for Pastor Theologians for sponsoring this episode. This episode is being sponsored by AG1 by Athletic Greens. Some of you know that my dad is a doctor, and as I get older, he's always telling me to watch my weight and exercise regularly. But in the last few years, he's also been telling me to pay attention to my gut health. He's been persuaded by all the research saying that the biome of good bacteria that lives in our guts is critical to our long-term health. There's just one problem. I hate taking lots of pills and vitamins and supplements. And why do they always have to be so big? That's one of the reasons I was excited to try AG1 by Athletic Greens. AG1 is a foundational nutritional drink with 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food ingredients. I take it first thing in the morning before I've had my tea and before I jump into my morning routine of writing my daily devotional. And I'll be honest, it tasted way better than I expected. I've been doing it for a few weeks now and I feel great knowing I'm supporting my health and not having to gag down a bunch of giant pills every morning. And that's why I've stuck with it because AG1 is a super easy daily habit. So if you're looking for a simpler and cost-effective supplement routine, check out AG1 by Athletic Greens. And right now, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com slash holy post. That's athleticgreens.com slash holy post. Wow. 
My guest today isn't really a guest at all. She's our brilliant friend and Holy Post colleague, Caitlin Chess, and her second book has just launched. It's called The Ballot and the Bible, How Scripture Has Been Used and Abused in American Politics and Where We Go From Here. Our conversation today is really just an introduction to the book's themes, because Caitlin has also produced two explainer videos based on the book for The Holy Post. One is already available on our website and on YouTube, and the other is coming soon. She's also hosting some discussions related to the book for Holy Post Plus subscribers, and no doubt many of the ideas that she's written about will come up frequently on the show as we head into the 2024 election. All that to say, Caitlin's book is a must-read for every Holy Poster. It really embodies what we're all about. It's smart, it's faithful, it's nuanced, and it will help you make sense of the crazy times in which we live. Caitlin, of course, is a doctoral student at Duke Divinity School. Her first book was The Liturgy of Politics, which is also a must-read. She's an award-winning graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary, and of course, she's a co-host of The Holy Post. She also loves babies, and she has perfected the podcast eye roll. Here is my conversation with Caitlin Chess. Caitlin Chess, welcome to the Holy Post. Thank you, Sky. Yeah, I'm going to treat you like a complete stranger, <laughs> that, like you've never been here before. I'm going to mm. be kind and, and hospitable. Oh, because you normally are really mean yeah. to me. <laughs> well, you know, familiarity sometimes can breed contempt. Oh, Taylor and Swift. I don't know what that means. <laughs> she uses that in a song. Does she? Yeah, she does. It's a lyric? Yeah. That's impressive because that's not an, a melodic sentence. Um, my kids, my girls especially, listen to Taylor Swift in the car all the time with me. And my 15-year-old who's got her driver's permit is always, oh. you know, I'm always in the car. I can't, every single Taylor Swift song sounds exactly the same to me. Sky, we should not start off this way. This is not all good. Right. <laughs> I don't want to be angry at you. <laughs> Okay, Caitlin, congratulations on the new book. Thank you. This is the week. This is the week when it actually is going to arrive on people's Here. doorsteps yep. who have pre-ordered it. It's the ballot and the Bible, how scripture has been used and abused in American politics and where we go from here. That's a long subtitle. It is. <laughs> and it's a, lot of, it's a lot of promise. That's a lot of promise. Yeah, we'll see. You're going to explain <laughs> all this. Um, spoiler alert or I guess disclosure... I endorse this book. I read this book months ago. I love this book. So um, it's fantastic. Everyone needs to get it. Phil also uh -huh. endorsed this book and a bunch of other really brilliant people, including some other Holy Post pundits. Mm -hmm. um, you did a phenomenal job. What a great follow-up after you. your first one. Thank you. Okay. So the book walks through all these different eras of American history and how the Bible was used. Mm -hmm. And one of the more surprising things we discover is that, guess what? Everyone used the Bible throughout American politics <laughs> to support their point of view. Yep. Um, I, rather than walking through all those different eras, yep. I want to talk first about one of the themes I picked up in the book is that different political movements will gravitate towards different parts of the Bible mm -hmm. to try to back up their point of view. Some movements really emphasize like Old Testament narratives. Yeah. Other movements emphasize the commands or teachings of Jesus or the apostles in the New Testament. Um, one example early, early in the book is the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. Can you briefly recall like w how different sides used different yeah. parts of the Bible in their argumentation during the revolution? Yes, yes. Um, I, it's such a good picture of what you were just describing because on one hand, the loyalists who want you know the colonies to stay loyal to Great Britain, they kind of rely on direct commands in scripture and they have some really good ones like they go to Romans 13 you know obey the government they go to first Peter 2 which literally in the King James translation says um, honor the king so they've got direct mm -hmm. revelation of this is what you are supposed to do obey the authorities over you especially even the language of the king whereas the patriots tended to go to Old Testament narratives sometimes to New Testament sometimes they would go to Revelation as well where there's descriptions of you know government power that has gone quite awry but they would often go to Old Testament stories, stories of corrupt kings. They especially loved 
the story of Esther because it allowed them to focus less directly on the king, but on the king's like underlings being the evil ones. So they could feel a little less, you know, kind of wrong for criticizing the king, but they could still call attention to an unjust structure that was harming the people of God, which they saw themselves as. And so it's interesting looking back to see, I think today we tend to think that the power is in the direct command, obey the king, you know, honor Mm -hmm. the king, obey the government. What often has been true in both really kind of negative ways and in really positive ways is that what's really captivating for most humans is the idea that a story in scripture that has this sense of transcendence and meaning and depth actually describes the conditions that I am in. And then I can find myself in a certain place in this story. So if I'm telling a story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, against the authorities. I want to be the person that's like willing to go into the flames to be faithful to God against the unjust ruler. That gives me a sense of purpose and excitement and meaning. And I don't think that that's always wrong. We can find examples like this, um, or maybe not even examples in the Revolutionary War, but earlier examples in colonial America as well, where we found ourselves in the story of Israel and said, just like Israel, we are right. you know, kind of adopting the promises and the judgment and the commands. So it can go quite awry. But I also think it says something about how humans are, like how we were created to be, and something about what is so powerful about scripture, why God chose to reveal himself through these written words handed down through generations of the church is we are captivated by stories. We want to find ourselves in stories. That's really dangerous, but it also can be really positive too. Yeah. You, you mentioned in the book, the early colonial era where so many colonists, especially the Puritans identify with the story of the Exodus, Mm -hmm. right? It's the Israelites coming out of this evil Egyptian empire, just as the Puritans left Europe, left England to be this holy people, you know, light on a hill, all that stuff. Okay. One of the things you mentioned there is how we always see ourselves in the midst of the story. Uh-huh. I forgot who it was. Someone coined the idea of the Disney princess theology. Uh-huh. You're familiar with that, yeah, yeah. right? Where where we always see ourselves as the hero yep. in every story in the Bible rather than as a potential villain. How do you see this happening now in our current mm. politics? How do you see different groups gravitating toward narratives, certain narratives in the Bible to justify their pre-existing point yeah, of view. Yeah. And not just, I think, the hero, but also the oppressed and the downtrodden. Like, we can't really right. get away from the fact that scripture honors the marginalized, the vulnerable, the oppressed. Mm-hmm. And so if you want to find a powerful story in scripture in which to motivate your own political action, it's going to be a story in which you have to paint yourself as the exiled or the oppressed or the marginalized. And you see that today from a variety of different perspectives, but people want to paint themselves not only as the kind of underdog, but as like the righteous underdog, (laughs) like no one else, it's kind of, you know, like the prophets, like sort of, no one is as righteous as me. (laughs) Like I am the one that is just like faithfully continuing, you know, I'm responding to God's call and no one else is doing it. And I think you can see that, like, like I said, in multiple different places. And I just, it's always a place to pause and say, under what conditions does it make sense to put yourself in that place in the story? And when is that more of like, a desire to emotionally appeal to the to the story instead of actually the conditions you're in. A good example in history being, as you just said, during the colonial period, there's all this emphasis on the exodus. You know, we are the people of God that are going to kind of finally receive flourishing and justice after being oppressed. Many of the people in that period increasingly used that language without any regard for the fact that there were both native people that were truly being oppressed by those with greater power and then enslaved people who would later Mm -hmm. use the exodus story to describe their own work for liberation their own faithfulness to god who had promised to liberate his people in the past and liberate in the future and i think that historical kind of difference and difficulty of like how did they see themselves as the oppressed people needing God to liberate them out of Egypt and into the promised land, but then miss the people who were really in a similar condition. That's a good reminder, not only of, okay, I I have to do more work than just read scripture well. I can understand what the Exodus story means. I can see that it still has resonance today, but then I have to do this additional level of work to say, who really are under these kinds of conditions? What other resources do I need to read the context that I'm currently in to know if I'm really in that position, to learn from people who are actually in that position, and then to say, 
I, I think it pushes against our desire to, or our kind of like concern or caution about seeing ourselves in the stories to go, yeah, people have seen themselves in a place that they shouldn't have seen themselves. On the other hand, when it comes to enslaved people and then later in the civil, civil rights movement, black people in America were not enslaved, it was, I think, appropriate for them to see themselves in this position and to draw on the power of the language of scripture to faithfully assert their dignity in a world that was denying it. So that makes it a lot more complicated. We can't just say, like, no, don't see yourself in the Exodus. That's a that's a illegitimate hermeneutical move. No, actually, sometimes it has been really faithful. It's just a lot harder to discern when it's faithful than we might think that it is. Okay, so that brings up another theme that comes up as you go through these different eras in your book. There is certainly a theme, the one you just mentioned, of different communities identifying with oppressed peoples in the Bible. Mm-hmm. The, the Hebrew, the enslaved Hebrews being probably the most vivid yeah. in the Exodus story, or the exiled Hebrew, yep. or the Israelites in, in the exile, or you mentioned Esther during the revolution, mm-hmm. all, all narratives that put your community in the place of underdog, oppressed, seeking God's justice. But then what <laughs> seems to happen throughout, you see this in the Bible itself, but you see it throughout American history, eventually your group acquires power. Mm-hmm. You essentially become Egypt or you become Babylon. And then the text you tend to go to is Romans 13, yep. which is obey the governing authorities. Mm-hmm. And you wield that one out because now you're in power and you're oppressing others. The, the colonists use that and use it to, to suppress the rights of Native Americans or enslaved Africans, whoever it might be. You're, you've produced a video for the Holy Post on mm-hmm. Romans 13, which is not out yet, yeah. but it's based a lot in your book. Can you talk about that text and how it's yeah. sort of a Rorschach test for how yeah. we view scripture and politics overall? Yeah, I start that chapter by saying, okay, here's some examples in contemporary politics of how we've used Romans 13 um, in support of separating children from their parents at the U.S.-Mexico border, um, in uh, support of or against Black Lives Matter protests, in support of COVID-19, like meeting restrictions or mask regulations. And then I say, and depending on how you felt about all of those things, things, you probably had a different emotional reaction to Romans 13 being used in that context. And it probably wasn't, and this isn't a bad thing necessarily, it probably wasn't because you've really thought about when Romans 13 applies and doesn't. It's just my reaction to this is really rooted in what I want to be true politically. If I like it, right. then like, yes, Romans 13, obey the government. If I don't like it, then maybe Revelation 13, the government is like the epitome of Satan, you know? So right. we really are responding and we can't help this. None of us are blank slates that just come with like no preconceived ideas about this. We're coming with motivations that we might not even be aware of. But I think what's important, I mean, there's so many things you could say kind of hermeneutically about Romans 13, but I think the most important first one is to say, this is coming from someone who was imprisoned by the Roman Empire and later killed. So we can't, and written to people who were intimately aware of the ways in which government could go wrong. So no interpretation of Romans 13 that says the government's always right could possibly make sense, either with the experience of the people writing or reading it, or with the whole narrative of scripture in which we're filled with colorful examples of people in official authority positions misusing their power. Yeah, okay, but... What's so weird about Romans 13 is how quickly we flip its mm-hmm. use. So the the most vivid example you mentioned in recent history was Jeff Sessions when he was the attorney general under, under Trump yep. in his administration, used Romans 13 in a public speech arguing that you need to submit to the authority of the government and that's justification for the things they were doing to families at the southern border. So... A lot of Trump supporters just a few years ago were were using Romans 13 to say, you need to submit to the government. Some of those same Trump supporters today are saying the Justice Department that used Romans 13 to say submit to the government, that they should no longer have to submit to the Justice Department because it's been weaponized against Donald Trump. So in the matter of months, they've ignored their own rhetoric Mm -hmm. from Romans 13 because it no longer fits the politics that they want. Like, is it that subjective? Is it that fickle how we employ scripture? Well, I think this is a really good example of 
the problem of the kind of habits we have of coming to scripture when it comes to political questions. We tend to do something that I think at its root has this like element of faithfulness to it, but it's just not a good way to read scripture, which is a political situation, a moral situation, a social situation presents itself. And we are like, we're good Christians. Let's go to scripture. Maybe we pull out a concordance. Maybe we look up the word and see like, you know, what verses deal with this. That whole kind of approach I think really doesn't do much to confront the biases that we're bringing. Even the word you look up in the concordance. Okay, so let's say you're dealing with something with immigration. You could look up immigrants or you could look up justice or you could look up foreign. Like there's all these different words that you could assume best apply to this political situation. So you're already dealing with your own biases, your own prejudices. And you're approaching scripture with, I'm going to make a little list of verses pulled out of their context I'm um, that which does really end up prioritizing direct commands which are outside of the kind of whole structure of like an epistle or out of the whole structure of the law and it really deprioritizes narratives which are a really actually important part of us understanding the moral instruction of scripture so it has all these problems and then you have with Romans 13 you just have this idea it's detached from a larger political theology, a theology of human communities and authority and how it relates to God's authority, this this huge area of Christian theology that we have been debating and talking about for thousands of years, you don't have that. You just have a verse you've pulled out of context. I wish what we would do instead is say, okay, for the next year, we're all reading scripture together. We're reading across the canon. We're reading different genres. We're doing it in community. And we're trying together to construct a political theology. What is the meaning of human government? How does it apply to our lives as Christians? What's the relationship between the, you know, kind of earthly authorities and the church or the earthly authorities and God's authority? There's so much in scripture that gives us indications of this larger political theology, images, narratives that would inform questions like how should we respond to someone like Jeff Sessions saying, no, actually obey the government. and, And that means we separate children from their parents at the border. We would have more resources to respond to that if it wasn't just, okay, well, he used this verse. Let's find some other verses. Let's pit them back and forth and see how many. He has five verses and we have four. It would instead be, I've spent time meditating across the canon, and I'm trying to construct this larger theology. And then it opens us up to resources throughout history and around the world. Like We are not the first people to go, let's look at the whole story of scripture and see what it means for our political context. We have so many resources available to us for that. So here's the metaphor that come that I use when I think about this issue, which is not from your book, but it should have been, <laughs> but you didn't ask me. So I tend to, I look at the Bible like a, a bucket of, of Legos and you oh. dump those Legos out on the floor, right? It's, it's all these verses, all these books, all this content. And, and some people dump those Legos out on the floor and then they just randomly choose which pieces they want to pick out and they build something with it and they go here, you know, yeah. obey the government or here I should get lo- my taxes lowered or here you need to, you know, end slavery, whatever it is, their biases. And, and because it's built from Legos, because it's using Bible verses, they go, this is the biblical argument. This is God's will for this issue. And what you, what I hear you saying is that's not a faithful way to engage scripture. Instead, you got to realize that this bucket of Legos came with instructions. Yes. And it's supposed to be assembled in a certain way. And those instructions come to us from, you know, good hermeneutics. It comes from church history of thousands of years of people before us constructing with these bricks. It comes from the global church. It comes from community. It comes from... And when you look at the instructions, there is a faithful way to build a political theology with these bricks. But a lot of Americans just totally ignore that and argue, well, I built it with the bricks from the Lego, so they're from the bucket, therefore it's faithful. Well, you've really picked, I mean, this is like Irenaeus, early church father talked about, you have all these little pieces, you can make a mosaic that makes a picture of Jesus, or you can make a Mm -hmm. fox, like you have the same pieces, you just construct them in different ways. But there are, we are not without resources for helping us do that well. And this is where the Romans 13 example is so good of you know, I, I wrote this book really often thinking about people in churches and families having conversations about scripture because so many among Christians of our conversations about politics are cherry picked verses pitted back and forth against each other. Yep. And what I didn't want to say is like, I'll give you a list of hermeneutical rules that'll help you just like really defeat your grandma at the Thanksgiving table. <laughs> I wanted right. to say like, what does it look like for us to really have humility and and curiosity when it comes to scripture and our political lives? And one of those is to say, I don't think I can construct this by myself. I don't think that I will have the right, either I don't have the intellectual resources, I also don't really trust my own fallen heart to just do it by myself. 
but I'm not without resources. Like there are examples, right. not only, I mean, in American history, which is what this book is focused on, but throughout all of kind of Christian history, there are examples of great faithfulness and great misuse, and we can learn from both. And a big, That's a right. big part of my desire for this book too was to say, for people who are looking at their most immediate, recent, especially white evangelical history, and feeling like there is nothing redeemable here. We just need to maybe chuck scripture out of our political lives because it has just been so misused. I wanted to say there are actually examples, even in your own backyard, even in your own history in America, of real faithful biblical interpretation that the movements that it spawned of abolition, of a lot of social reform movements, of the civil rights movement would not have happened in the same way if it wasn't motivated both by real genuine faith in God to eventually provide justice and to motivate faithful work toward justice now. But the language of scripture, these narratives that captivate people's hearts and give them the strength to endure great suffering and opposition and to get a picture of, of the God who liberates and redeems and, and promises to do that, not totally now, not until the end of time totally, but but still do it now, even when we feel like we can't see it now. Yeah, and that's one of the great takeaways of this book, and it also comes out in, a, in the recent video you made, the Holy Post video um, on scripture and politics, mm-hmm. is just because it's been so terribly abused is not an excuse for abandoning the role of scripture in our public life. And when you see scripture used faithfully or the ways it's been used faithfully throughout American history and church history, it should inspire us to use this amazing tool to bring goodness and flourishing. Um, Before we get to some contemporary examples, I want to talk about one other theme that came out really strongly Mm -hmm. for me as I read this book. And it conforms to one. I've been rereading Mark Knoll's book, uh, The Civil War as Theological Crisis, which I know you cite in here. And it's it's also really fascinating. but one of the themes that comes out in your book is sometimes, and I see this today, mm-hmm. those who can make the simplest argument from Scripture are often the more persuasive, yeah. even if it's wrong. And during the Civil War or the, the decades leading up to the Civil War, the South had a really, really, really simple biblical argument for slavery. I mean, they could just cite, slaves obey your masters. Yep. And from that, they go, the Bible endorses slavery. The Bible endorses slaves submitting to their masters. Uh, The Bible never says that emancipation is the only Christian way. They had a very simple biblical argument. Whereas the Northerners, especially the abolitionists, also used scripture Mm -hmm. a lot Mm -hmm. in their arguments for ending slavery. But it was a much more complicated and nuanced theological and biblical argument. Um, Are we doomed into a, a, (laughs) a reality that whoever makes the simpler case wins? Or how do you see that even in today's contemporary yeah. landscape of Bible and politics? And Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. I, but I also think, and this is something that really struck me when I was doing the research, especially for the Civil War chapter, I read, I mean, there's so much out there um, of contemporary yeah. historians like Mark Knoll, but also a lot of contemporary biblical scholars evaluating the arguments made in this period. Not only because it's obviously this like very significant moral question, but also because it's it hits right at a time when a lot of new biblical scholarship in Europe is right. starting to influence America. So it is a pretty good case study of like, how does our hermeneutics shape our social and political yeah. lives? And But what's so interesting to me, and not everyone does this, but a vast majority of the things that I read, contemporary biblical scholars and historians sometimes, focused almost exclusively on two white sides of the fight, like the slaveholding uh-huh. people and the abolitionists. And I can understand why people today might even really feel discouraged looking at that because of what you just said. Like, okay, here's the simple, God said it, I believe it, that settles it, here's the verse, mm-hmm. versus, and it was true at the time, a lot of white abolitionists were drawing on new biblical scholarship from Europe, some of it employing methods that people today would be uncomfortable with, I would be uncomfortable with, right? Kind of saying, well, let's, Right, and let's, the sou- Southern Southern preachers were arguing that abolitionists were actually atheists who didn't believe in the authority of scripture, and they were using yeah. that to motivate people in the South to fight for the Confederacy is yep. we're the ones who believe the Bible, and we're trying to preserve the faith, not just slavery. And it was like, you hear the echo of that today right. in so many right. arguments. And they weren't totally wrong. There were a lot of, of abolitionists that sort of said, like, yeah, let's just get rid of talking about the Bible. Like, it does not right. address our moral question for the day. But the ones who did would often have really complicated, sometimes things that we just, like, now know are ridiculous. Like, really trying to mm-hmm. reinterpret, did Abraham really have slaves? Or what was the system like then? Using history that we now know isn't right. Or relying on biblical scholarship methods that said, let's just, like, get rid of the historical particularities and go to, like, the kernel of truth in Scripture. 
culture and the kernel is love. And so love means we should free enslaved people. Um, Love the end result there, but don't love the like stripping of particularity of the biblical story. But it's interesting that for all these people that focus on these two white sides of the fight, there are such rich resources. Like it's actually incredible how much we have access to of enslaved and free black Americans writing about this and, and very often, overwhelmingly often, returning to scripture to do it, which is itself kind of amazing. Mm-hmm. Like you'd think that they would look at this and go, again, like we were saying about today, it's too tainted. Like why even bother? And there were some people that said that, but overwhelmingly went back to scripture and interestingly did not use the complicated biblical methods that white abolitionists were using. Instead, they said, let's not strip away the historical particularities and find the kernel of truth. Let's really dive into the historical particularities. Let's see ourselves in the story of of the Exodus. Let's go to Revelation and think about judgment that is coming on injustice and evil. Let's really actually understand what we late what later biblical scholarship would say, oh, that's great. Let's see ourselves as recipients of this story, as members of God's family throughout all of time and history. Let's us, let's believe strongly that how God has acted in the past is how God will act in the future. Let's not actually act as if like let's kind of strip all the supernatural stuff out of the story, which would become popular among a lot of white theologians. Actually, let's go. Yeah, God intervened. God parted the sea. God will do those kinds of things for us. And what I think that should teach us is not only we need to be listening to to marginalized people. We need to go to people who are actually in the conditions that scripture describes and hear how they're interpreting it. But I also think it should be a comfort to us right now who are dealing with really difficult moral questions and thinking, I have to get a PhD in Hebrew to possibly address this. And the right, answer is right. you don't. It is hard. It does require a lot of work. But that work has more to do with reliance on the Holy Spirit, involvement in a community, listening to the marginalized than it does knowing absolutely every technical biblical thing that you can. Those resources are great. But in this case, it was actually the people who had the most theological education that were very often wrong when it came to when it came to slaveholding people. And when it came to abolitionists, did some kind of not great things with the Bible, like for good reasons, but they weren't actually really faithfully reading it. It was the people who were most deeply and intimately affected by the moral problem, by the great evil, by the great injustice. That's almost clearly what scripture demanded them do. Which is very humbling, for yeah. sure. Um, and leading back to your thing that we need community, including yeah. people who are marginalized and outside of, of um, power that can help us really read scripture more faithfully. Okay, uh, apart from the beautiful way you take us through parts of history that we may not be as familiar with in the way the Bible is used, I love the later chapters of this book because you talk about the Cold War and the way uh-huh. scripture was used there, which I talk about all the time mm-hmm. on, on our show. But then you have a chapter very recent about the way George W. Bush and Barack Obama yeah. both use the Bible in their presidencies. And we don't talk about this because it feels too recent maybe uh-huh. to think about it. But I, okay, this chapter fascinated me. Start off with just describe, uh, I, there's so much to unpack here. Uh, generally describe how Bush and Obama both mm-hmm. talked about mm-hmm. their faith and talked about scripture. Yes. So for this chapter, I focused on, I looked at some other things, but I especially focused on the eight prayer breakfast speeches that both of them had, because it was just an easy way to compare. Okay, you each had eight speeches. This is kind of the moment where the president gets to use the most explicitly religious language, address religious people. Um, And so Bush and Obama had very different approaches. Bush, which often people will think of as like super Christian, super religious president. That's the kind of Al Mohler said that at the time. People say it still today. Other than Reagan, probably the most kind of conservative Christian, he's our guy kind of person. And yet Bush's religious, his faith was incredibly personal. He didn't talk about it a lot. He actually never in any of his eight prayer breakfast speeches said the name of Jesus Christ. He talked, which is crazy. Which is crazy. He talked a lot about kind of general sovereignty. He talked a lot about our faith that we share. He relied on a really kind of civic religion way of Mm -hmm. describing this. We all sort of believe the same things. He occasionally referenced other religions, but he really focused on our similarities. You know, the Abrahamic faiths. We all kind of believe the same things. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think that's true, but that's kind of the way that he would talk about it. And he really relied when it came to voters and elections on identity. I'm one of you. I have a conversion right. story that fits evangelical expectations. I, I really play up that it was Billy Graham <laughs> that helped me become right. a Christian. And, and He famously in the 2000 election, I remember this vividly, he was being interviewed and some 
journalist asked him what I think the question was what political philosopher is most influenced yes. mm-hmm. you and and he said Jesus Christ because he changed my heart and that was like it wasn't a dog whistle it was just a whistle yeah. whistle yep. that yep. said to every voter out there I'm an evangelical like you yes and afterwards when he was asked about that his description was very like I just wanted people to know like what personally motivated me it mm-hmm. wasn't about my mm-hmm. politics it wasn't about some kind of like public thing it was just this is what what comforts me. He talked a lot about those kinds of things. This gives me personal comfort. Right. This gives me personal guidance. Obama, very different background than, you know, Texas Methodist Church like George W. Bush. Obama became a Christian in the context of working with black churches in community organizing. So churches that are involved in a very different way in their communities. And the way he talked about his conversion was in some ways very evangelical. I mean, he spoke with in very plain orthodox christian language about like i needed a savior i'm a sinner like i needed redemption there is one way it is jesus but he also talked about wanting the community of the church and wanting the community of the church to seek the good in the community that he was trying to seek so in his presidency he talked a lot more actually explicitly about Jesus. He, he mentioned Jesus in almost all of his national prayer breakfast speeches, including one time in which he talked about the nail scarred hands of Jesus. Yeah. Let me hold on. This is a quote. I just found this. This was in Christianity Today. Uh-huh. He was being interviewed by CT. Obama said, I am a Christian and I am a devout Christian. I believe in the redemptive death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I believe that faith gives me a path to be cleansed of sin and mm-hmm. have eternal life. Mm-hmm. There you go. That is a far more explicit <laughs> gospel articulation than anything George yeah. W. Bush said yeah. during his presidency, which yeah. is nuts because that's not the way these two men are framed politically. Right. Obama spent his entire presidency trying to convince the country that he wasn't Muslim. <laughs> right. So it's like, that's well, wild. Okay. So that gets to my point here. I When I read this chapter, I, I did not take either of these men's words about faith or the quoting of, of the Bible as any indication of their own faith convictions. Mm -hmm. But when you put it in its political context, George W. Bush, everyone knew he's an evangelical from Texas. And he made, play that up during the campaign. 9-11 happens. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of anti-Muslim fervor in the country. And so Bush doesn't need to play up his Christian Mm -hmm. identity as much. He doesn't need to quote scripture as much. Instead, he he offers a more inclusive vision of American religiosity, maybe explaining why he doesn't mention Jesus a lot at the prayer breakfast Mm -hmm. or at all. Barack Obama, who's a progressive Democrat, who has an Arabic name and who's the first African-American president, is constantly being tagged as a foreigner, as a Muslim, as an outsider. And so it's politically beneficial for him to really talk about the Bible, to talk about Jesus Christ, to talk about redemption through the cross, all that explicitly. So are both of these men, both of these politicians, just using the Bible in a politically expedient (laughs) way? And does that explain how they used it in their administrations? I think a little bit. I think the other difference is, and again, you really see this if you look just at the prayer breakfast speeches and kind of map them out you know, here's eight versus Mm -hmm. the other eight. I really think that Bush was relying on this sense of, well, we all kind of believe the same things. It's good for America. It's good for the the strength of our country for us to all kind of just have some sense of generic faith. Let's just rely on that kind of general language. Obama was exposed by his anthropologist mother to a variety of religions growing up. And he came to faith in a community organizing context that focuses a lot, the way those people are trained is to be really honest about their differences. Like, tell me what your self-interest is and we can work it out. And his way of talking about his faith and other faiths in the National Prayer Breakfast speeches is to really focus on the specificity. He quoted from scripture more often than Bush. He also quoted from the Quran and the Torah. And he talked about more religious traditions than Bush did. He more often talked about non-religious Americans. But it really seems like for him, it was like, let's bring the moral language that has shaped our country, which has so often been Christian, to bear on our on our contemporary questions without excluding other people. But the way I best not exclude other religious traditions is not by pretending we believe the same things. We don't. That actually kind of erases the differences and makes it all sound sort of vaguely Christian. I think he wanted to say, I am bringing the specifics of my faith, which include the specifics of scripture. This is what scripture tells me. One of his prayer breakfast speeches, he got a lot of pushback from more conservative evangelical types because of how explicitly he connected policy to biblical commands. But it was right. it was specific on his end in, in, I think, in kind of an act of hospitality of like, let's you bring your specific things too. like, let's all be right. more 
honest about where we're coming from and work it out. We, we're going to have different. I mean, he even in one of his prayer record speeches, he says, like, we read from different books. We believe different things. We worship different gods. Like, it is not the same. But this is an opportunity in the National Prayer Breakfast for us to to talk about those differences and to not pretend like our public lives can actually be separated from our private lives. This is not to say that Obama was like the better Christian and did the better thing, right. partially because I do think really what distinguishes them not only is this kind of question of how they addressed pluralism, but Bush, I think, really was relying on Christian identity and Obama was relying on Christian language. And neither of those are really... I'm, I'm trying to fully bring Christian convictions to bear on policy. Both of them are, in a certain sense, as you talked about, a political decision. You know, he talked very explicitly, Obama did, about, I don't want the Democrats to lose the moral language of our country over to the Republicans right. as if they're the only ones that get to quote scripture or talk about Christian faith. So there is politics at play, really, in both of them. But I do think there's something for us to learn about increasingly in the world that we live in, we're having questions about, can I bring Christian convictions into the public square? Mm -hmm. Is that appropriate or not? And I think Obama gives us some some positive examples of actually, when I bring that very specifically with the awareness that this is my specific tradition I'm coming from and you might be coming from another one, that actually can be a fruitful way to engage. I know you're familiar with this, but there, when he was a senator in 2006, Obama gave uh -huh. a very, I, I think, a really interesting speech yeah. about the role of faith in, in public policy. and. You know, the Democratic Party has a reputation of being the more secular party, mm -hmm. right? The non-religious party. And so Obama in that speech was arguing from the black church tradition largely, we can't give up on the moral language yeah. of faith and the moral language of Christianity specifically in our policy making. On the flip side, the Republican Party is the one that's seen as the Christian mm -hmm. party, the religious party, the, you know, the religious right and all that. And so with George W. Bush, there was this constant effort to kind of downplay because there was the assumption that, oh, these crazy Christians in the religious right are, right are making all their decisions based on the Bible. One of his advisors in the White House gave a public interview and he said, quote, I can tell you that George Bush is not making mm -hmm. decisions based on his own personal faith. So you have Obama saying, hey, we Democrats, we need to make more policy decisions based on faith, yep. biblical faith. And you have Bush saying, I'm not making policy decisions based on biblical faith. And you can see how each one yeah. is trying to correct for the mistake that their own party is often accused of making, which, yeah, yeah it's just a fascinating look at, you can't just say one side has an objective engagement with the with the scripture and the other yeah. doesn't. There's so much that politics does in shifting how it gets used in in the public square. All right, we are running out of time here. A couple things before we go. Number one, everybody, the ballot in the Bible is now on sale. Go grab it. If you've already got your copy, help Caitlin out and leave a review <laughs> yes, on Amazon please. or wherever. That's actually incredibly helpful for us as authors. Um, and then, Caitlin, you're going to stick around and we're going to do a bonus interview talking specifically about Jeremiah 29, the whole seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile, which has a long history in the church and a lot yeah. of contemporary And we have use. fought about it before, so. We have, and we're going to fight about <laughs> it again because, uh, you know, we just want to offer people the full yeah, perspective yeah. that's out there. <laughs> um, but congratulations again on this book. It's such Thank a huge you. resource as we're going into this election year. And it's an accessible book, as brilliant as Caitlin is. She knows how to put the cookies on a lower shelf <laughs> and, and write in a way that's super engaging for uh, an average reader. So go check it out. Caitlin, congratulations. Thank you for sharing it with us. And we'll talk more in uh, Holy Post Plus. Yeah, thank you, Sky. The Holy Post Podcast is a production of Holy Post Media. Production assistance by Mike Stralo. Editing by Area Code Audio. Help us create more thoughtful Christian media by subscribing to Holy Post Plus at holypost.com slash plus. Also, be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcasts so more people can discover thoughtful Christian commentary plus ukulele and occasional butt news. Visit holypost.com for show notes, news stories, Holy Post merchandise, and much more.